Okay, good morning to everybody. Gaetano, Paolo, Renko, and Alan, we are very glad to have you here in Girona for the, for the first time. Paul and John, welcome back to Girona. This is the first workshop, Questio Facti, International Journal on Evidential Legal Reasoning. Questio Facti is also the first junior, journal in the field in Spanish, Italian, and Portuguese spanning, sp uh, sp uh, speaking countries. It is an open access and peer reviewed journal, and the, is and the issue number one will be published next month. We accept papers in English, Spanish, Portuguese, and Italian, and we encourage you to submit your papers and to help, you, to help us in the dissemination of this new journal. For the first uh, presentation of this first Question Facti worship, we have with us John Jackson. John Jackson is Professor of Comparative Criminal Law and Procedure at the School of Law uh, of the University of Nottingham. He has previously Dean of the School of Law at the University College Dublin, and before he was Professor of Public Law at the Queen's University. John Jackson's research fields in, lie in the areas of criminal evidence and criminal justice. He has particular interest in empirical and policy research and, and is the author of a number of books, articles, and research reports in these areas, including Judge Without Jury, Solicitor Advocates in Scotland, Legislating Against Silence, and the Detention and Questioning of Young Persons by the Police in North Northern Ireland, and uh, recently the standards of prosecutions and analysis of the national prosecuting agencies in the, in the United Kingdom, and then in, in Ireland, New South Wales, the, North, the Netherlands, and Denmark. And, the, and his mo most recent book, authored with Sarah Summers, is The Internationalization of Criminal Evidence Beyond the Common Law and Civil Law Traditions. John, it's a pleasure for us to have you here, and then yeah. it's your time. Thank you very much, uh, Jordi, and um, uh, thanks to Carmen and everyone else who's been contributing to this new uh, journal, uh, which is, uh, I think, a very exciting development for the, not for the sort of global um, world of evidence scholarship uh, that we're now seeing. Um, I'm delighted to be back myself personally to Girona for the second time within a fairly short period uh, after the most successful conference of last year. Uh, I'm sure this workshop will, will be um, just as uh, stimulating for everyone involved. Um, my uh, topic uh, to, to start us off is looking at the area of um, witness evidence um, in pre-trial and trial procedure. And um, I will be making the argument that uh, we certainly, maybe in the Anglo-American or common law world, are seeing a, something of a, a change away from our traditional focus for witness testimony being at the trial stage uh, towards more pre-trial procedures. Um, I, I know that those of you from the more civil world, civil law world, uh, will not find this at all strange that the evidence is taken formally from witnesses uh, at a pre-trial uh, area, pre-trial phase uh, of investigation leading on to trial. Uh, but in the common law world, this is not such a tradition and um, yet we are seeing some changes. And I guess my question is going to be whether this change, these changes are leading to uh, a different kind of paradigm, in a sense, away from the traditional focus on the trial uh, with emphasis on uh, orality and um, confrontation uh, 
as key principles in the contested uh, traditional sort of common law trial. And uh, we're moving away from that maybe towards um, a focus on the pre-trial, which preserves our principles of due process, um, but uh, has to have them translated in a different way to enable that focus to take place. And some of the, the, the obstacles uh, that we see in the place of this, particularly from a sort of Anglo-American perspective, and I think it would be interesting maybe to get some uh, views from civil law lawyers, philosophers here, who uh, will want to maybe engage with some of the debates that we've been having. But uh, first of all, I guess there's an issue of um, uh, what we might say is terminology. Um, so I, I, I've talked in terms of the title of the paper being diluting principles of, um, I use the term initially as um, immediacy um, or orality uh, and confrontation. And um, uh, I suppose it, in a sense we confront perhaps immediately here uh, a challenge of terminology. Uh, we are more comfortable I think in the common law world talking about a principle of orality uh, to mean effectively uh, in-court testimony taken at the trial being really the focus of attention. Um, I mean, Roberts and Zuckerman uh, observed that live courtroom testimony uh, delivered orally by witnesses with relevant first-hand knowledge of the matters in issue uh, is the paradigmatic form of evidence in English criminal trials. Um, it's not to say, of course, there are a lot of trials that don't get contested. A lot of uh, cases don't come to contest at trial. I'll maybe come on to that. But um, that's a, a key kind of statement uh, really underpinning this principle of orality. Um, but I think in, for people in Spain and other civil law countries, this is more perhaps known to you as the principle of immediacy. Um, and uh, I got some sense of the difficulty of terminology uh, at uh, a conference I've just been to on Anglo-German debates uh, on evidence and procedure when I was told that certainly in Germany, uh, and I'm not sure about Spain, the principle of orality is actually um, quite differently interpreted. Uh, and it really means in German, and it's actually defined in, the, uh, in their code of criminal procedure in terms of, uh, yes, the focus of attention is the public trial, uh, uh, and the public trial is the exclusive locus of fact-finding. Um, but it means more in terms of the judgment of the court, um, that the court's judgment cannot be based on anything that has not been discussed at trial. In other words, you've got to derive your judgment, judges, from what is uh, put before uh, the trial. But as it's pointed out to me, that doesn't necessarily mean oral evidence of witnesses. That can mean documentary evidence. Anything that's submitted, as I understand it in Germany, in, in the trial can be the focus of, uh, can, can be used for the judgment. Um, but it's a different meaning from what uh, we would have as a principle of morality in the common law world, because we see this very much as a witness is giving live testimony. Uh, and in Germany, the focus is more on the judgment being based on the evidence of the trial, which doesn't have to be live testimony. And uh, they were saying they also have in their code of criminal procedure a reference to immediacy. Um, and it's that reference to immediacy um, that is paralleled with our principle of orality. And in terms of immediacy, they t mean really what we say is orality, that live courtroom testimony is the ideal form. But in Germany, it's not the only form of giving evidence. Um, so I think it's just an interesting illustration that maybe of some of the terminological difficulties that we have in our debates together, uh, that when we say one thing, we think well, we, we know what the principle of orality is. Uh, certainly some of the, the Germans were perplexed by this and sort of putting me right in terms of what they see the principle. But I, I'm going to be focusing and maybe using that term orality and, and immediacy together um, as uh, being um, uh, certainly important. 
for, for us. Um, and then the other term is, um, uh, and, and there you can see in the, in the PowerPoint just that the principle of immediacy in Germany requires every witness is heard in person by the trial court and the witness's evidence must not be replaced by documentary evidence. That is immediacy, but it's not necessarily orality. Um, then confrontation. I think, again, there's more um, acceptance here of what we actually mean by um, confrontation. Um, but again, there are some terminological uh, issues perhaps there. Um, confrontation, in some respects, in England has a, a different meaning sometimes in terms of um, a procedure for identifying witnesses um, when we are unable to have an ID parade or uh, a formal process of identification. We, we, we might confront um, uh, witnesses with the accused in order to make the identification. Sometimes that's called confrontation with us. Uh, and uh, again, I think in civil law procedures, you have a process of confrontation sometimes at the pre-trial phase when witnesses, and maybe at trial as well, uh, are, are, are sort of put into a position of confrontation uh, where they confront each other uh, with evidence and they challenge each other uh, sort of face to face. Um, but it's not seen in that respect as a, as a right. Um, and of course, confrontation often has this more meaningful sense of being a, a right, um, a right to confrontation, obviously famously um, underlined in the um, Sixth Amendment of the US Constitution. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to be confronted with the witnesses against him. Um, again, in the civil law world, in terms of a right, it probably has had uh, less uh, historic importance, but clearly now um, we see some representation of the principle in the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, where it is, of course, stated in Article 6, 3D that everyone charged with a criminal offence has the right to examine or have examined witnesses um, against him. Um, though it's interesting, just again, we were just taking that expression uh, as, as it means in English, that it doesn't seem to necessarily, as it's written off the page there, mean that the accused has a right to examine personally. Uh, another way of protecting the right is to have witnesses, ex have, have witnesses examined against him. In other words, it may not be the accused doing the examination or even the accused counsel. Interpreted in that way, it could be the judge, could be somebody else. The important thing is that the witness is examined. Uh, so again, perhaps slight dilution there in terms of the, uh, just on the face of it in the European Convention of what the right to confrontation um, actually means. Um, but I, I guess what we see together here is a kind of paradigm which one might call orality or if you like immediacy, confrontation paradigm. And Professor Stefan Maffey has written a book uh, on um, confrontation in, in the European countries, the European right to, sorry, the European right to confrontation in criminal proceedings. Um, I think it's now in a second edition, actually. But uh, he talks about this paradigm really in terms of a no, having a number of different components to it. Um, um, and uh, here he kind of makes the argument that confrontation is not just a right to examine witnesses, um, but it, it does have, combined with this principle of orality or immediacy, a number of, of features, um, which I'm sort of going to use as, as the paradigm for the talk. Um, six features in particular, he, he mentions um, the importance of publicity so that you're giving evidence in open court uh, being important as, as opposed to, again, a pre-trial procedure where there may not be um, openness in terms of uh, the, the proceedings being open to the public. Um, obviously, this idea of the presence of the accused being very important for the accused to meet the accuser eyeball to eyeball, as it's sometimes called uh, in that uh, forum of the trial. Um, the importance of the presence of the fact finder, wherever that happens to be, it could be a judge or jury, of course, in Anglo-American context, to observe the witnesses. So it's, it's a sense there of seeing the demeanor of the witnesses, uh, not just uh, off the page, maybe what they have said, what they say uh, in transcripted form, but uh, how they are giving their testimony. 
um, the importance of the oath, witnesses to give evidence on oath or some degree of formality associated with um, the evidence that they give. Um, the fact that the witnesses uh, are personally identified uh, in that um, the accused knows exactly who the witnesses are uh, and are able maybe then to sort of use them, their history uh, by some way of challenging their, their evidence um, from, a, from the point of view of credibility. Um, and then this idea of adverse questioning, sort of finally the idea of uh, questioning the witness, um, cross-examining as we would of course call it in the Anglo-American world, that, that becomes the sixth component to Maffey's sort of paradigm as he um, phrases it. Um, and what I'm going to sort of just sort of sketch out a little bit uh, to begin the talk, to, to advance it further, is to show how important this, this paradigm has been. Uh, we are seeing uh, a dilution of it in a number of different respects. And um, it, it's possible maybe to, um, to, to, to think of more respects than this, uh, but I suggest that there are at least six. Um, some of them, maybe there's a little bit of overlap, uh, there may be others, um, but in six respects at least, I'm suggesting, we're seeing um, a movement away from this orality, confrontational uh, paradigm. Um, and uh, I'm sort of going to speak briefly about them. Uh, first of all, um, the hearsay rule, which I, again I know is a, a rather specific Anglo-American concept, this idea of hearsay. Um, but uh, if we move on to it, um, we've seen a relaxation of this rule. And I, I suppose without going into the technicalities of it, uh, one can see how the hearsay rule um, is uh, sort of buttresses the orality principle uh, or immediacy principle in terms of the witnesses giving live testimony. And when testimony is important is not given before the court, it's excluded under the hearsay rule if that testimony is going to the truth of issues that are in contest in the trial. Um, and this is a key way of, sort of underpinning um, orality because obviously it means that um, uh, witnesses' evidence outside the trial that people maybe report on uh, in the trial, that would be excluded um, under the hearsay rule. So it's a way of kind of incentivizing parties to bring the witnesses to the trial. And um, sorry to go back to um, hearsay for a moment, sorry. Um, we, we've seen a relaxation of this rule over the years in England and Wales. I think it's fair enough to say we've seen relaxations in uh, other countries as well, as exceptions have been made to this principle. Um, and in England now, we have you know this. A uh, bit unusual in some respects when it comes to evidence law, which has never really been codified by us. But in terms of hearsay, we, we have what some judges have called a crafted code in uh, an act which has brought all this together, Criminal Justice Act 2003, uh, which was a kind of pivotal moment for legislation. Um, traditionally, um, the exceptions to the hearsay rule uh, were developed by judges in the common law. Um, and the judges took that responsibility and there were some kinds of considered reliable hear forms of hearsay, um, public records, for example, and certificates, um, uh, confessions to an extent if they, if they qualified and were admissible, um, could be uh, admitted uh, and these were developed by judges. Uh, in 1965, without going into much, too much history, there was a sort of turning point, an important case in the House of Lords, or sort of a then, a then the, the name given to our sort of Supreme Court, um, uh, made a judgment effectively saying that judges should, make, should no longer make exceptions to the hearsay rule. This was a task for Parliament. This was a task for the legislature. Um, and again, you know, we had then this movement towards legislation on hearsay. Um, we had sort of various acts leading up to this 2003 Act, which has codified the area. And 
as I say here, has made exceptions for all manners of documentary records, be they public records, be they business documents, expert reports, um, other matters uh, are sort of now uh, admissible on the grounds really that they, that they have some reliability to them. And therefore, there's really no need to have the makers of those documents brought to court, no need to have them um, examined in live court testimony, because they have this um, uh, badge of reliability attached to them. Um, and so in a sense, there's been a bit of a, and, and I should say, I suppose this act of 2003 uh, was a culmination of quite a lot of debate on hearsay. We had two reports from the law commission, our law commission that looks into law reform. Um, we had a, 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 a big report by a, a, a court of appeal judge, Robin Auld, who you know, looked extensively into this area because there was a feeling that hearsay had become too technical and there was a need to sort of liberalise or relax it. Um, and a shift away from hearsay being presumptively unreliable towards, in a sense, almost it being presumptively uh, reliable, certainly in terms of these kinds of records. Um, it was accepted that, of course, there will be some uh, forms of witness evidence that are not reliable. Uh, but then the principle has, has been, um, and in, in those respects, it's still important to incentivise the parties to bring those witnesses to trial. Um, but if they become unavailable at the time of the trial, uh, unavailable for a whole host of reasons, um, for whatever reason, in fact, the witnesses does not uh, intend to testify, maybe because of being absent, maybe because refuses to, uh, out of fear, intimidation, or whatever, um, we move to this position where we might call it almost the best evidence rule where we could take the hearsay statement as, as, as admissible. If the, if, the, if the witness wasn't available, we could take earlier statements that the witness had made, particularly maybe to the police, and use them um, you know, to go to the truth of things uh, in breach of the hearsay rule, but as an important exception to it. Um, and, and this was not just sort of written statements, but oral statements as well. And we had these categories of unavailability. And generally, this is sort of extension, as I say, towards allowing in the, these statements when witnesses were unavailable. And then just finally, the, this um, discretion now given to judges under the Act. Uh, previously, we had these exceptions to the hearsay rule. They were quite technical. Um, uh, whether a piece of evidence came within the hearsay rule or not was arguable, uh, whether it was an exception or not was arguable. Um, we now have a sort of overriding discretion, which we call an inclusionary discretion, that the judge has to kind of admit any hearsay statement uh, in the interests of justice. So this is, in a sense, some would say, sort of subverting the, the, the traditional hearsay rule quite considerably because it gives the judge that freedom to say, even if the statement doesn't come within an exception to the rule, uh, bring it in anyway, because uh, it has you know, a hallmark of being reliable. And, and of course, what the meaning of interests of justice is defined in very sort of broad terms under the Act. There's a number of, sort of um, issues that the judge needs to look at in order to determine this. But it's a pretty broad discretion that the judge now has to, to allow this in. Uh, and I guess th that's the first inroad that um, I'm suggesting we're seeing. Uh, the concept of hearsay, of course, is still with us. And it's still argued about. But we, we see this dilution. Um, and then alongside that, um, we also see a number of other measures whereby even if we have the um, witness in court to give live testimony, we're putting more emphasis on uh, what the witnesses have said before court. Um, it used to be, and I don't want to be technical, because I don't want this to develop into a lecture on um, common law evidence, which is quite technical, but we, we used to have this rule that was called a, a rule against narrative. Uh, whereby um, we were quite suspicious of previous statements that witnesses had made. We wanted to hear them live. And, and it was possible to put previous statements to witnesses 
uh, to kind of, in a way, uh, perhaps challenge their credibility. Um, but those statements couldn't be used to go to the truth of, of the matter. Um, and uh, whether they were consistent statements, that the witnesses sort of saying things before that he now is saying, or whether there were inconsistent statements, statements that the witness is now saying uh, didn't happen or were not or untrue, um, you could bring them in to sort of challenge credibility but not to go to the truth. And again, this debate that we've had here uh, was very much in terms of is this really the right approach? Um, because in a sense, you know, might it not be the case that earlier statements that witnesses first make are perhaps the more reliable ones. And it's later at trial when people have opportunities to sort of embellish their testimony according to maybe um, the issues in contest in the trial uh, that we maybe need to be more suspicious of. So we had this sort of idea developing that in fact really we ought to be putting more emphasis on these pre-trial statements um, that the witness has made. Um, and I mean, I just give a, a quote here from John Spencer, who's one of our sort of evidence scholars of, of old. Uh, we we're talking about the, these people now, sort of, uh, who have been quite uh, instrumental in some of the changes that have been made. John Spencer was an advisor to the um, old report uh, that was fairly influential in terms of getting some of these things enacted. They didn't go far enough for him. But uh, we never let see these changes. And what we see is a sort of inroad into the rule against narrative. And he was very, he, he sort of launched this full scale assault on the rule against narrative um, and said, if there are two specific scientific facts about the psychology of human memory which are clear beyond doubt, um, one is that memory for an event fades with time, uh, and the other is that stress beyond a certain level can impair the power of recall. He was referring in stress there to the stress that witnesses undergo when they give live testimony, again, in a public trial. Um, and so he said, the rule against narrative stands the scientific knowledge on this question on its head, requiring us to accept the following propositions. First, that memory improves with the passage of time. And secondly, that stress improves the process of recall. So in a sense, it was a sort of damning indictment on our emphasis on in-court testimony, saying, no, we should be focusing much more on prior court, what witnesses have said uh, earlier on. Um, so as I say, we've seen these end words. I won't go into the technicalities. He wanted a complete abolition of this rule against hearsay, and just to, to allow in earlier statements that witnesses have said, and, and let the fact finder judge between them obviously taking into account the in-court testimony, but also just as much emphasis on what witnesses have said before. Now, um, the, 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 um, the way the reforms panned out didn't go that far. They're, they're still riven with technicality to an extent. There were always some exceptions to the rule against narrative, so to speak. And um, what we've seen is a kind of extension of them. Um, one example uh, sort of is quite illustrative, though, I think, is this idea that people would refresh their memory, witnesses in the witness box when they give testimony, from previous statements they'd made. Um, we called it sort of refreshing memory, uh, where the witness is supposed to memory be revived by the earlier statement, but it's still the in-court testimony that counts. And now, really, we've moved away from that to the extent that we now say that um, memory refreshing documents or documents that witnesses, the statements that witnesses have earlier said, uh, can be sort of brought into evidence more easily and used again as evidence of their truth, uh, not just to, in a sense, refresh the memory. Um, so that's a sort of a shift that we've seen um, in, in that direction. Uh, if we move on to the next one, sorry. Um, then, as well as that, uh, we've seen, I think, live yet, we, we've seen, uh, oh, it's not, yeah. Yes, that's, that's it. Uh, as well as that, just another example of, of, of um, diluting orality and confrontation to an extent is uh, the increasing use of um, uh, live links or technology to bring in test earlier statements uh, that witnesses have made uh, under the camera, on, on, on tape. 
audio or video uh, in certain situations. Um, in some respects, sometimes even replacing uh, evidence, they're what we call in common law world, the evidence in chief. So a witness will first of all be uh, examined by the party, the prosecution usually, that leads, the, that, that, that calls the witness. And um, th those statements will be the evidence, the, what the witness says will be evidence in chief. And then after that, the other side gets the chance to challenge. Now the witness here is still in, uh, the, the idea is now that certain kinds of witnesses under what we call special measures, particularly kinds of uh, vulnerable or intimidated witnesses, um, do not have to necessarily go into the public forum of giving evidence um, in, in chief, but their evidence can be relayed live, uh, by, by sort of a live link procedure. Again, perhaps this is something that's fairly familiar in other parts of the, the world as well. Um, but it, it, it sort of diminishes the principle of around to the extent that the witness is not in court. And um, yes, there is live testimony going on, but the witness is giving evidence uh, away from the, the, the stress environment of the court, uh, out of court. And um, that is one form of a special measure for these kinds of witnesses. Um, but in addition, we, we've sort of gone further than that and said that, again, in respect of some of these witnesses, what they have said previously, that, um, uh, in, on earlier occasions, if they've taken the form of a video recording, um, that can, in a sense, replace the evidence in chief of that witness. Um, the witness will still then maybe be available for cross-examination outside the court by means of a live link. Um, Although even that now, in certain kinds of witnesses, cases, it's proved difficult to bring this into being, uh, we can have a situation where pre-recorded cross-examination, where we have pre-recorded examination in chief and pre-recorded cross-examination, all taking place before the trial, with the witness not having to come to trial at all. Um, that's the kind of ideal that some would say we're moving towards. The process of giving the recorded video recording of the evidence in chief, that's now quite common, certainly for certain kinds of witnesses like children. Um, uh, then usually there's a live link cross-examination, but where it's proved difficult, and this comes to a theme that maybe I'll mention later, some of these things are, do prove difficult, but it's proved difficult to have pre-recorded cross-examination. Because that effectively means that you have uh, that witness's testimony recorded entirely, as I say, before trial, without the witness having to give this in-court testimony at all. Um, this is cross-examination, pre-recorded, is being trialled at the moment. It's taken a long time to get this right. Some of people are sort of blaming the technology, um, but I think there's some kind of re resistance and difficulty, systemic difficulties in, in, in going in this direction, which I'll maybe come back to. But we're, we're seeing a move in the direction of it. Um, and then just should make the point that live link evidence, the TV live link, and the video recordings of earlier accounts, they've been legislated for in order to happen in respect of any witness. Um, certainly the live video link evidence could be given by witnesses who were, say, abroad, um, and you know, that's not really controversial anymore. Um, we haven't yet brought into force um, this idea of having video recordings of you know, just any witness apart from these special witnesses who are under special measures, the, the vulnerable or the intimidated. The idea of having any witness as evidence pre-recorded is something we have legislated for but not yet actually seen in action. Um, so some of these changes are happening, some of them quicker than, than others. Um, and I, I guess that's... Uh, yeah, that, that's, that, that's that one. If we move to the next uh, idea then, or the next so restriction that we're seeing on this principle of orality, arguably this is on cross-examination itself. Um, so the idea traditionally is that uh, witnesses are examined, um, as I said, by one party and then they're cross-examined by the other. And uh, although there are certainly restrictions on cross-examination traditionally, that witnesses mustn't be entirely sort of uh, insulted the judges there to, to ensure there's fairness, there's been generally very free reign given 
to parties to cross-examine. This is part of the idea of confrontation, that you should be given a lot of freedom to challenge the witness. We won't be too strict uh, on the, the kind of questions that are asked um, to challenge the witness, whether they're going into the witness's past or whether they're challenging what the witness says happened in the trial and in the issues in contest. Um, we're seeing some change, again, in relation to um, these kinds of uh, vulnerable witnesses, um, children or people who have difficulty in communicating. Um, uh, um, we're now seeing, and, and particularly now also um, victims in sexual offences, um, now we're seeing the, the pure confrontation idea of eyeball to eyeball and personally cross-examining the defendant, personally cross-examining the witness. That's really no longer uh, allowed in respect of a larger category of witnesses who are vulnerable in some way. And uh, the defendant uh, really uh, you know, ha ha has not got allowed to do that. Um, and neither has um, counsel, and, and what I, I, his, must let his counsel do it. If he refuses to allow his counsel to examine, because he s insists that, you know, I've got this pure confrontational right, I want to challenge the witness personally, then the court will not allow that, um, uh, but may appoint a, a kind of special counsel to, to do the examining for him, to ensure that you know, fairness takes place, uh, but this is an interesting model that we're seeing in other areas as well of a, a counsel, again, who's not your counsel um, taking on a role in, 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 in the trial, uh, which, you know, in a sense undermines arguably this, the idea of certainly of confrontation in terms of um, you take, participating in the trial and challenging witnesses as you wish to do. Um, in respect of these witnesses who have difficulties of communication, and, and, um, we're seeing intermediaries being used so that um, counsel want to question the witness, but they're not allowed to do it necessarily directly anymore in respect of certain kinds of witnesses. Instead, they will put their question and it will be translated in, in a sense by an intermediary who will put the question. And again, that arguably undermines this idea of direct cross-examination. It's done sort of by, uh, and, and the idea of the intermediary is there to sort of make it easier for the witness to understand the question. But again, you can see how maybe this dilutes from the idea of direct cross-examination. Um, and, and then we're, we're seeing uh, even a, a stage where uh, judges are interfering more on what questions are put to witnesses. So as I said, traditionally, this, judges have tended to be fairly lenient in terms of the questions that can be put. Now again, for certain kinds of vulnerable witnesses, particularly children, um, the idea here is that if you have a pre-trial hearing uh, at which if you are the accused, the accused counsel, you will say to the judge, first of all, these are the questions I want put. And the judge will kind of approve them um, um, before going into the trial itself. In the trial, you'll still be able to put those questions through your counsel to, to the witness, um, but um, uh, they have been kind of pre-approved by the judge. And that, again, you know, arguably dilutes this idea that you should have this freedom to cross-examine, put these questions that, that you wish to the witness, rather than having them kind of vetted um, or pre-approved by the judge. Again, it's early days to see these hearings, that, that, but they are emerging um, interestingly enough, not necessarily under legislation, but under you know, rules of procedure that, that are increasingly becoming common um, um, in, in the way that our, um, our, our trial rules are, be, are developing. Um, and some have sort of said here, we're moving away from a traditional advocacy model that you can associate maybe with um, the orality uh, confrontation paradigm towards a kind of best evidence model. And what that means is um, often, uh, counsel, if you're cross-examining, it's important not just to challenge the witness and what the witness says, but in a sense to put your version of events to the witness. That's a very important part of our kind of adversarial framework. 
Uh, and it's important to do that because if you don't do that, you can be penalised later for not, in fact, putting questions to the witness um, in the adversarial trial. Now, um, you know, but, but the movement here, in a way, is away from the adversary model towards um, you only really being able to challenge what the witness said. Again, only these particular kinds of witnesses who are vulnerable. But you, you're allowed to challenge what they say, again, maybe through an intermediary, so not even maybe directly, um, but sort of to rather put aggressively your own case to the witness, that's being diluted. Um, and some have said we're seeing here a kind of revolution in terms of cross-examination. Now, again, I think we have to be careful because I think some of these changes are, are really go to the, the very depths of our adversarial structure. Uh, particularly this idea it's important to put things to the witness. If that's being diluted, uh, in a sense then, uh, we, we are seeing a big change. And, but we're also, I think, seeing some resistance, understandably, from counsel, who, who see this very much as undermining their traditional role in the adversarial trial. Um, we're coming on, I think, now to the, the fifth restriction, <laughs> and if you bear with me, uh, this is what I call maybe the rise in secret evidence. So if you remember, the paradigm, the orality confrontation paradigm, talks in terms of um, the proceedings being in court, in open court, in public. Um, and uh, again, you know, I'm not wanting to overplay this, but we do see now... Um, um, uh, you know, in-camera hearings uh, where the public are shunted out, that basically the, the trial takes place in private. Uh, in private. The, the, the parties are still there, the, you know, the counsel are still there, the judge is still there, the jury is still there um, in, in a jury trial, but the public are sort of taken out. And, uh, you know, where, where, whereas traditionally that this was a very restricted, that this could happen in, say, sort of spy cases or cases official secrets, where there were clearly very sensitive issues involved um, in the trial. We're seeing this now in, in terrorist cases, um, and some people are even suggesting that we should see them in these um, vulnerable, in these cases where we have vulnerable witnesses, in sex cases, which are now quite commonly uh, you know, uh, contested. Uh, um, uh, I, I'm, you know, in Northern Ireland, where I come from, um, there's, a, a judge has now called for these cases to be actually tried in private. Um, now, this hasn't happened yet in England, but we're seeing a shift, I would suggest, in, in, in the direction of in-camera hearings. Uh, I mentioned earlier the importance of being able to know who the witnesses giving evidence against you are. But... Uh, again, increasingly, and I don't want to overplay this because there's been a, a sort of absence, I think, of um, empirical data on just how common it is, but we are seeing uh, the use now of anonymity orders, whereby the judge will make certain orders in certain cases, uh, particularly where there's problems maybe of intimidation lurking around, and, will, uh, and can go so far as to say that the, the defence for example, are not allowed to know the identity of um, an accuser, uh, a, a chief witness against the, the defendant. These are hedged around with qualifications and with safeguards, so again, I don't want to overplay it, but we do see legislation particularly here governing anonymity orders. And, and you know, previous to this um, happening in 2009, we had a House of Lords uh, case um, uh, saying this was inappropriate at common law we just do not recognise this idea of anonymity. It goes against our tradition. And Parliament very swiftly sort of swept that judgment aside and came in to allow these anonymity orders to, to take place. It's a kind of special measure, but you know, quite an extreme one, arguably, in terms of the, the paradigm that I'm talking about. And then again, we're seeing now... Um, uh, the idea, again, is, is that any relevant evidence um, in the trial should be presented by witnesses and be allowed to be examined. But we have a process now whereby the prosecution can, in the absence of the uh, defence, go to a judge before the trial and say, yeah, there's some evidence here that's relevant, but we don't want it to be admitted in the trial uh, because it maybe involves a, a sensitive witness or there are sources of 
um, information here that should be kept secret. Maybe they are informants uh, working on behalf of the police, and it's important to keep their identity away from the accused and even what they maybe have to say. Uh, and so the, the, the prosecutor will kind of test the judge and say to the judge, really, you know, take this evidence out. Don't let uh, the other side see it. And the judge has a sort of balancing test then and ultimately override that and say, no, I think this should go to trial. But again, it's, it's a further sort of vetting on the part of the judge, which is more than just the traditional sort of admissibility, more than just relevance, but uh, effectively saying that, you know, unless the evidence maybe is so important for the defense, this evidence will be, will be kept hidden from the defense. And we call these PII, public interest immunity hearings in the absence of the accused before the trial. And then, I mentioned special counsel, this idea where people pop up uh, in, to advocate for your interests. Um, we see that in this context uh, also, certainly, you know, again, not common, but it can be the case that the judge might say, well, uh, you know, I, I want to just be sure that I'm being fair here and I want to hear a kind of defense point of view in these hearings. I cannot uh, ask the defendant to come because obviously the defendant will then be seeing the evidence. I cannot ask the counsel to come, but I can appoint a special counsel to do that uh, job. Um, and then just finally, um, we've been talking about witness evidence, but of course defendants can also be um, called as witnesses. And um, thank you, that's <laughs> suspects interviews. Uh, but, and, and defendants frequently now uh, do give evidence. But uh, we've also seen a, a movement that, in a sense, goes very much to the core of what, witness, what defendants have said earlier to the police. Now, it was always the case that confessions could be admissible. Um, but often they would be challenged in the court, maybe in terms of what was said, by <coughs> oral evidence in the court. The judge would make a ruling on the admissibility of the confession based on um, hearing live evidence, albeit in the absence of the jury. But now, under sort of reforms in the 1980s, we, we reviewed all our processes for taking uh, evidence from, from suspects before the trial. We give safeguards. So in the police station, when you're being questioned as a suspect, you're entitled to have a lawyer. Um, but what also happens is that what you say uh, will be recorded. Um, not just audio recorded, but video recorded. And evidence of that video interview can now be screened in front of juries, provided the judge you know, has made a ruling that it's admissible, uh, so that um, juries can see, or the fact finders can see, uh, the, the witness giving evidence, the defendant, now you know, as a defendant, then as a suspect, how that suspect reacted to questions at this earlier stage. Um, and, and this is becoming very common, in fact, to the extent that you know, quite often on our TV, when we have high-profile trials, um, we see record, these video recordings, particularly after maybe the, the witnesses, uh, the, the defendant's been convicted um, um, and sentenced. We're allowed to see how the, the witnesses responded as a, def, as a suspect. Um, we don't actually televise our trials but we allow in this kind of evidence to ultimately get out to the media after the trial. So, and and they, they are important because we link this in a sense with increasing inroads into the right of silence so that um, it's not just, it's possible for suspects, of course, to say no comment in these when questions are put to them. They can say that um, in the police station when they're being questioned. Um, but uh, we've now got these... Um, uh, inroads into the right to the extent that if you fail to mention things in the police station at the su in the suspect interview that you later then want to raise, inferences may be drawn against you on the grounds that you didn't raise uh, these facts earlier. Um, so again, this puts the pressure on the suspect to uh, to open up, and say things at the. Um, in the, um, in, in the police station, even with access to, to a adv legal advisor, uh, on the grounds that it may be difficult for you. If you don't do this now, uh, later on, it can harm your defense by not speaking up now. And so you get, you know, as I say, 
an entire vista of what the witness, has, the suspect has said in the video recording, put through to the jury, and they can make their assessments. And arguably, that becomes just as important as what a defendant says at trial. And sorry, before leaving, uh, one of the, the judges uh, in the Court of Appeal kind of spoke about this as a very sort of benign phenomenon. He sort of thought this was a good thing because basically, just as John Spencer was saying, it's important to get witnesses um, to say what they happened early on, to get their evidence early on. So this judge in the Court of Appeal, Justice Laws, was saying it's important to hear from suspects what they want to say or what they have to say when they're challenged early on. And um, so, so we talked about a sort of change of culture here, um, you know, away, I would say, from this orality confrontation paradigm. A number of measures in recent years have served to counteract a culture which had long been established in the practice of criminal cases that, in principle, a defendant may, without criticism, withhold disclosure of his defence until trial. Now the police interview and the trial are seen as part of a continuous process in which the suspect is engaged from the beginning. And you know, I suggest that that, again, is a sort of dilution of this um, paradigm that I've been talking about. Um, and the, the judge talked about this as being a benign con continuum. Um, and to extend that out a little bit further, uh, I suppose the question I'm sort of asking myself here is, are we not just in relation to, to defendants, but in relation to witness evidence generally, uh, are we seeing a change? Are we seeing enough in these shifts to see almost a new paradigm emerging, uh, whether benign or not, and that's one of the questions we can turn to, where pre-trial procedures effectively replace the trial. I mean, this is quite revolutionary from a common law perspective as the focal point for admitting and challenging <coughs> evidence. And in a sense, through these means that I've been talking about, um, we're seeing a, a paradigm shift uh, and some will say it's benign on the grounds that you know, it's important to hear from witnesses early on to preserve, their, at the very least, to preserve their testimony uh, and keep it for the trial if needs be. Um, and it's important, obviously, to hear from suspects early on uh, as well. And this kind of goes hand in hand with um, you know, an increasing feature, which is, um, I alluded to it earlier, that um, uh, you know, increasingly, of course, well, we've always had a situation where defendants can plead guilty. It doesn't have to be a contested trial. Um, but, you know, again, um, pressures to avoid trials are such that um, we, 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 we like the idea of defendants pleading guilty um, if they can, as a, as a, if, 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 if they wish to, there's a sort of voluntary element to it. But, of course, the more that things have been kind of set down in stone beforehand and the defendant is kind of trapped into things by what the, the suspect he may have said earlier, what witnesses have said and so on, um, the more the defendant may feel the way out is to plead guilty. And of course, there are incentives for this, which is very important, that you get a discount in sentence for pleading guilty. And the earlier on that you do this in the process, uh, the more of a discount that you'll get um, and, um, you know, in a sense then, the idea is that if you can maybe bring in these pre-trial procedures, uh, then this can um, be a benign phenomenon because, uh, in some respects, um, witnesses then don't have to come to trial and d defendants can get value out of it in terms of uh, a sentence discount. Um, this process, has it been challenged? Uh, and of course, the obvious ultimate sort of focal point for challenge for us in England, Wales would be, in the UK would be um, European Court Human Rights Challenge. And I don't want to go on too long at all on European Court of Human Rights jurisprudence. Um, but by and large, I think one can say, and it's maybe a little bit of an uh, uh, overstatement, that uh, the European Court has been pretty relaxed about these ch shifts in the UK, um, they um, ha have, have never really stood out strongly in favour of the orality confrontation paradigm in the pure sense that I've kind of tried to explain it. Um, now, it is true in a, in a leading case that led, led to a lot of dialogue uh, 
um, which I don't want to go into the whole saga, but a case called Al-Khawaj and Tahiri against the UK. Um, the European Court said that I, the ideal is that uh, an Article 6.3d, the right to examine witnesses, kind of enshrines it, that in princ the, the principle that before an accused can be convicted, all evidence against him must normally pr be produced in his presence at a public hearing with a view to adversarial argument. Interesting, you know, the word adversarial being used in a predominantly civil law court, arguably, because the judges come from a civil law tradition. But th they pay, if you like, lip service to that. But then they, they quickly go on to say exceptions to this principle are possible um, so long as they don't infringe the rights of the defence, which do as a rule require that the accused should be given an opportunity to question witnesses. But key to this is not necessarily at the trial, now, either when that witness makes his statement or at a later stage of proceedings. So the European was quite relaxed about you know, the idea that witnesses can be challenged before trial, and, that, and that's quite clearly the case. And looking at the specifics without going into the, the details of how um, English law is matched up with the jurisprudence of the European Court here. In that case of Al Kawaja and Tahiri, um, the, the court ultimately said, though it, you know, it, it liked to hold on to an idea that it had, in which it talked about um, solar decisive statements being, being, uh, ex being allowed to be examined by the defence. It did backtrack on that principle somewhat in the al case by ultimately saying, looking at the whole English context and the, the crafted code of hearsay that I've already mentioned in the 2003 Act, it made the point that in principle, that certainly the safeguards in the Act, um, supported by other legislation and the common law, hedged in with you know, safeguards provided by the judge, who's ultimately there to determine the admissibility of statements, were in principle strong safeguards designed to ensure fairness, although everything does depend on the facts of individual cases. Uh, and that's a little bit of a throwaway line, because it does mean that it's probably fair to say that the European Court hasn't given the legislation a complete bill of health, clean, a clean bill of health, if you like. Uh, it has said it will look at each individual case, where there's been fairness in the proceedings there. Um, and it, interestingly enough, you know, it said in there were two cases, al Khawaja and Tahiri, and one of them it held the principle there had been fairness, and the other one it said there hadn't been. So the court will look at specific cases, it will scrutinise it. But in general, it gave this fairly, you know, this bill of health to this movement, this shift that we've seen in terms of hearsay in the, um, in the English context. And then again, in terms of the right of silence, um, the European Court, again, has taken, made strong statements that these are important standards at the heart of fair procedure. Um, but they have ultimately sanctioned the idea of inferences being drawn from silence when you don't say things to the police, provided, again, there are strong safeguards. Um, and uh, they will scrutinise those safeguards in individual cases. Now, um, uh, I'm suggesting perhaps that you, know, you can look at the phenomenon I've been talking about as a benign continuum. You can also look at it the other way and say this is a, a, a malign continuum. Because uh, even though the European Court has sort of given its blessing to some extent to it, has said it will scrutinize things in individual cases. And there are particular you know, fair trial standards, I would suggest, that are not really being honored as we move in this direction. And I suppose I'm suggesting that if we're really going to take this idea seriously of a shift in paradigm towards the pre-trial, uh, we need to introduce stronger safeguards. And this could be difficult uh, for the sort of culture of our system. Um, so for example, at the moment, uh, you know, you've no right to disclosure of police evidence before uh, the suspect witness interview. So, um, so if you're being questioned as a suspect, you, you, you've no right to know the case against you. The, the police can more or less sort of say things to you, question it as, as they wish. Um, a lot will depend on how effective your defence counsel advisor is in this context, but you may not have one. Uh, also, I mentioned this idea of the early plea. It sounds a good idea, but the first court appearance, which is when you, know, you will be given the biggest discount if you know first court appearance, come say clean and say I'm guilty, 
at that first court appearance, you will not have any disclosure of the prosecution case necessarily um, uh, presented to you. So you're kind of get issuing that, making that guilty plea in the shadow of the evidence against you, not really knowing what it is. Um, and then, although we've seen these video ideas of taking video recordings, um, we have a tradition of formal procedures for taking and challenging witnesses before a trial. So these things happen without formality, without judges becoming involved. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's difficult, therefore, to, um, to instill fairness, I would argue, in, in this process. We, the police statements that are taken, there's very few rules as to how they should be taken in respect of witnesses. Um, and uh, we have an absence of formality. We, we did used to have committal proceedings that allowed for witnesses to give their evidence before the real trial, and the magistrate would decide whether there was a case to answer. Those have sort of gone out of fashion, and in a sense, they never became particularly um, significant because the defense often didn't challenge the witnesses at that stage. Um, and this goes, I think, to a, a cultural problem that we have with this shift away from the orality confrontation paradigm that, uh, however benign we might see this in, in, in theory, even if we were to entrench some of these safeguards, we, we have this traditional resistance, I think, to the idea that we should um, have um, a front loading, if you like, of witness suspect testimony. And uh, we, we see it really in terms of um, this problem of d disclosure uh, and, and particularly the problem of pre-recorded cross-examination. This issue I mentioned earlier whereby vulnerable witnesses may not have to go to court at all. It would be good to spare them. It would be good to have them being questioned and cross-examined, if you like, before trial at, a, at an earlier stage. It's proved very difficult to, to get this underway in the English context. Now, there's problems with technology, as I mentioned, but there's also real resistance. The idea would have to be that prosecutors have to then disclose their evidence at this early stage, and that's proved difficult. The defence also are kind of resistant because their whole idea is that they wait to trial before you challenge, because that's the paradigm that we're used to. Um, and I suppose my ultimate question here, in sort of concluding, uh, throwing it out, is that... Um, you know, is it actually possible, desirable, e even if we could affect fairness, is it desirable to do this? Uh, this idea of um, the trial being a kind of proxy for orality and confrontation, if, if we move that sort of challenging to an earlier phase, but without the public trial, would we be missing something? And I guess in our culture, I'd suggest that we probably feel we'd still be missing something, even if we could do this in a benign way. It would still be this idea that we are, um, we are, I wouldn't say addicted, but we are, um, we feel it's important to have the live adversarial trial, and, and I'll end at that stage, at that point. Right. Thank you so much.